Thank you so much for dropping by our channel today. My name is Leah and I'm so glad you're here. You're about to watch the most recent sermon preached and recorded during our weekend services here at Chapel Springs Church. If you're new here, don't hesitate to pop over to our website at chapelsprings.org for more information about our great church. Enjoy the message. Well, good morning, Chapel Springs. Isn't it a beautiful day? What a moment to be able to be in this, uh, in this room together and for those watching by line to be able to consider what God is speaking to all of us today in terms of how we can reach out, whether across the street or around the world. And today, my prayer is, I trust that, that our hearts will be inspired to the point in which we're able to look deep inside individually and corporately to be able to say, Lord, we've done this, but what else can we do? How do we move the dial? How do we give of ourselves even more deeply? And before I begin, I just want to say, it is so good to be here. You have such a great reputation as a generous church, as a church that sins, as a church that prays, a church that goes. And let me tell you, I, uh, just because of the role that I've had for several years, I'm in so many different churches across this nation and in different places in the world, really. And, uh, and, and I know good leadership when I see it. I know poor leadership when I see it. And you are blessed to have Pastor Scott as your pastor and his family and, uh, and his leadership team are amazing. And, and let me tell you, when you have a good leader like that, you surround them in prayer, you hold up their arms, you protect them, you, you charge heels for them. Is that right? And, uh, and I want to just say what a great season it is for you as a congregation. And I'm inspired by not only your history, I'm inspired for how you're creating history. What you're doing to prepare for not only the present, but the future. And so it's, it's so important to be informed and encouraged by our past, but it's a lot more important to know where God's leading us towards tomorrow, amen? And I'm just so excited for you. I want to do two things this morning. The first thing I want to do is I want to create an overview, a 30,000 foot view for a moment as to what our efforts are doing today through your partnership with the Assemblies of God World uh, mission. What does it mean for us to partner the way we do? You know, in the book of Acts, there's a chapter in Acts 13 that gives us the model of how we do what we do in partnership today. And we recognize that with Jesus' great mandate, the great commission in the back of their minds and the Holy Spirit coming to the church for empowerment, for witness, that it was in that moment in Acts 13 that the Holy Spirit began to speak to the entire congregation and called out individuals from within that congregation. And at that time, it was Barnabas and, and Saul who was Paul and separated them for apostolic witness, which is being able to take the gospel across boundaries where Jesus is not known, where his name is not yet proclaimed, where the church has not yet been established, where hope has not been received, where there are no disciples. And that model has been going on for over 2,000 years, and we are part of the continuity of that today. That as you pray, as you give, as we go, you are continuing to be that Antioch that is sending to all parts of the world missionaries and also coming alongside with missions projects to ensure that at least once every person has an opportunity to be able to encounter the the grace of God. Can you say amen? amen? So let's look at what's happening just in a nutshell today through our efforts. And then after I do that, I'm going to pivot. And I want to speak to you about our motives. What is it that should truly motivate you and me to more effectively align our priorities with what God's asking us to do both locally and globally? Well, let's look at a map of the world. If I were to show you a map, you may not be aware of this, but our efforts are now in over 190 countries of the world. Can you say amen? That on the ground, we have global workers, missionaries that are serving with their families in order to be able to do exactly that, to bring hope to communities. It's interesting that if we were to measure the last 15 years of our missions efforts alone, that every 54 seconds through our missionaries around the world and our churches that we have partnerships with, A person comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Isn't that amazing? 
So just in the last few moments, people have been coming to know the Lord. That means that every 76 minutes, someone from those congregations that have been planted as people come to know Jesus are called into ministry to be a spiritual leader within their community. Isn't that powerful? And that every 81 minutes, a new church has been established that never existed prior to it. Isn't that awesome? That's because of the partnership, because of your understanding of what Christ calls us to do together. This means that today in those 190 plus countries, we now as of this morning have 2,600 and 40 missionaries worldwide. Can you say a big amen to that? Isn't that amazing? And our hope is that this is going to grow exponentially. This coming week, I'll fly back in and we will be interviewing a large candidate class of young families ready to go to the field for the first time, Pastor Scott. And you've seen that as you've served on the World Missions Board, what that means for them is they decide that they're going to give their lives away to the call of God, to go to places where people have not known Christ before. Isn't that awesome and that you're a part of that? And the reason that happens is because you support that. This means that around the world, that as of today, there is around 50, nearly 56 million people in our fellowship alone. That doesn't count all of the others in other denominations or fellowships or networks of churches, but just within our own fellowship, worldwide, we now number 56 million together. Those churches have been meeting And then that means represented in that number are 367,000 local churches, just like Chapel Springs. Can you say amen? Isn't that powerful? You see, and there was a day where that did not exist. Those numbers would not have reached that high at all. But it's because generation after generation that we were able to pass along the vision, just as you're doing today in this mission's emphasis that we are teaching, that we are creating culture, that we are renewing our commitment, that we are understanding clearly what is the priority of God and how do we align our lives with his heart. That's how you end up with these numbers. But this is not satisfactory, is it? Did you know that today there are still 42% of our world that has never really encountered Jesus? Out of the 8 billion on the planet, there are thousands of, in, of people groups that are still waiting. They've never experienced a moment like this where they sense God's presence, where they are singing together, where they're lifting up hands as surrenderance to God and His grace and call upon our lives collectively. They have never had those moments. And our heart is to be able to say that we will not quit. We will strive until Jesus comes or every individual has at least an opportunity to understand the depth of the love of God for them through Jesus Christ. So let me pivot for a moment and I want to speak to you about that. How does that occur? And what is it that should truly motivate you to align your heart with that cause? So let me speak to you about mission and motive. It's no secret if you you read the Bible that God is on a mission, that he is working redemptively in the world, that there is not a community, a village, a township, a city where God is not already intimately present and working, waiting, calling his church to arrive on the scene and to embody the hope that he's given us in this place. What motivates you? I mean, honestly, what is it that truly motivates you every day as you crawl out of bed to be able to align your heart, your decision making, your time, your talent, your treasure with what concerns God's heart? I'm often asked this question, and over the last many years as Cheryl and I raised our children in Africa, and observe the brokenness of our world in so many different places that you often have to ask yourself, what is it that will motivate me today to give my best, to ensure that I'm surrendered to God? 
Over the years, I had the privilege and honor of training and equipping African men and women to be able to cross boundaries, languages, cultures, to go into territories, regions, and nations, to be able to share Christ in areas that were highly resistant to the gospel. Many times very difficult, treacherous, dangerous. Some of those students who even in the last 36 months have given their life for the cause of Christ. But every time that happens, two, three, four more stand up, fill their shoes, and continue the ministry. What motivates them? There is this concept that theologians often refer to in Latin called the imago Dei. It means the image of God. It's profound because it speaks to the intrinsic worth of every human being. Every man, every woman, every child. It's profound because you can see it threaded as a biblical theme from Genesis to Revelation. And often, many times, it emerges with power and force in the pages of the Bible when God is calling his people to action in the world. In so many occasions, it has inspired my heart. It's been emotive. But perhaps you're like me where I have been inspired at times by a biblical concept that I know to be biblically true that has a transformational moment in my life. But then when I walk outside of those moments and experience the world daily, I end up coming to grips with something that, well, I have to guard myself from. You see, Scripture teaches us clearly about the image of God in every human person. It teaches the intrinsic worth we have because of that imprint in our life. But it also teaches us that that image has been marred and wounded and deformed. And so that many times, oftentimes, as I look at other people, it's difficult for me to see the image of God in them. And if I'm not careful... If I don't guard my heart, then I'll allow the emotions of this wounded world that's volatile and unpredictable and broken to be superimposed upon what I know to be biblically true, which should govern my emotions and set my motives. Because if I do not, I will find that my heart is jaded to the very world that God has called me to embrace. So what is it that should truly motivate us? If it is true, I mean really true, man, that every person is made in the image of God, then the first motive must be value. Value. You see, because we're made in the image of God, it means then that every individual is the object of God's love and desire to save and to restore that brokenness back into what he originally intended for our lives. It means every man, woman, and child. No one is excluded, everyone is included. And it means then that no matter my nationality or my ethnicity or my culture or the language that I speak, my gender, my age, what I've done for good in life or bad in life, and whether I even acknowledge that God exists, and even if he does by chance, Would he even acknowledge me? That because we're made in his image, we are the objects of God's love and desire to save. To restore our brokenness back into what he intended for our lives. Because of value. Because if that's true then, that becomes the lens of how I am called to view the world as God views the world. Because what I've learned is, is what God loves, I am called to love. And what God values, the church is called to value. Value. But if value is important, the second may be more so. And this is what I like to call capacity. You see, if it's true that every single person is made in the image of God, and therefore they are the object of his love and desire to save and to heal and restore our brokenness back into what he intended for our lives as we bear his image, then it also means that every individual in this room and watching by line, every single person 
has been designed by God to have the capacity, the ability to embrace his grace and be changed by his love when they first hear the gospel. You see, it doesn't matter then my nationality or ethnicity or my culture or the language that I speak. My gender and age has nothing to do with it. And whether I acknowledge God, believe in God, and even if he does exist, whether he is aware of me, that because I'm made in his image and you are made in his image, he has designed us with the ability, the capacity to say yes to the gospel and be changed radically by his grace. It means that everyone is a candidate for his love. I mean, come on, let's just be real here for a moment. Let's lay our cards on the table. I mean, why in the world would you come this morning if you didn't really believe in capacity, man? I mean, why go to your device digitally and watch online? Why turn on the lights? Why go through the motions of the worship? Why in the end of this service will we commit ourselves to pray, give, and go? I mean, why do any of this if we don't believe that every single person has the opportunity in their life based on their design by God to respond and be changed by his love? If it's a roll of the dice, if it's just by chance, that perhaps you can come to Christ We're not so sure about you. Perhaps your pedigree stands out. Your background and the choices you've made disqualifies you. Because if I don't truly believe, I mean really believe that every single person is a candidate to receive God's grace, then there will be self-limitations I impose on myself as to how much I'm going to involve myself in your life, much less someone I've never met. Capacity. Capacity is what drives us. Motivates us to get up in the morning with a different attitude. Aligns our priorities, our decision makings. It determines the direction of our time, talent, and treasure. It renews hope for today and tomorrow, no matter how broken and volatile and unpredictable our world is. It's how we decide to walk up into our neighborhood day after day and look at the world at large. We are the bearers of hope. We are the ones that recognize that while the world may be disillusioned and unaware, they retain value. And God loves them. Because if he can change us, he can change the world. Because if I don't believe in capacity, then there will be limitations as to how I decide, or if I decide, I'm going to cross the street in my neighborhood. Share my own testimony of grace with the person on the factory floor, or in the marketplace, or in the school hall, the classroom, my business. Let me illustrate it this way through the life of someone dear to me. In this group, you'll not be able to see his face, but he is in a circle of students. When we first were called to Africa, we were asked to open up a graduate program. By the time it was over, there were hundreds of students that were enrolled in this program. And you cannot see him here, but it was interesting because we began in one nation in Malawi. And then it grew to students from 16 nations. And then finally, Canadians and Americans and earning a a credit degree for one particular reason. It was for those that since they were called to plant churches in difficult, resistant areas. And over those years, not just hundreds, but thousands of individuals were sent to those frontier areas to do that. One individual that decided to study came not from other African nations or from the West, but came from Asia, from the nation of Pakistan. And during that time, and we'll just call him Saeed for his security, he ended up coming and for three years he dedicated himself, only returning to his home country to see his wife and two young daughters in order to be reunited for a moment. When he graduated, 
He ended up graduating with honors. He was bright. He was intellectual. He could speak several languages. He loved the Lord. He was overjoyed in his devotion to Christ. And he went after graduation immediately back to his home country. Being reunited with his wife and two young children, he took six months to discern what God was asking him to do with his life. And at the end of that six months, he was convinced that God was calling him to a region in the north of that country. A region that had been resistant to the gospel and was a seedbed, even considered by own government, to be a seedbed of terrorism. Having prayer, thinking it through, understanding the hostility and what was at stake, they boarded a train in this large southern city. Several hours into the north, they rode that train. They came to a certain area where they came to a depot that allowed them to walk by foot by kilometers into this regional area. Meeting with elders and chiefs, they had permission to live among them. But they were marginalized immediately, held in suspicion. But they began, Saeed and his wife, to love the people in that community, to share Christ, to show compassion. And just over two years, for the very first time in generations of us having any knowledge of the gospel touching the people of this area, over 200 people came to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Can you say amen? Isn't that powerful? The one step led to another. And all of a sudden, this incredible region began to be evangelized. And it wasn't easy. Every soul that came into the kingdom, it seemed as though it advanced and increased the hostility, the resentment for Saeed and his wife being among them. And I remember being in Miami preaching at a missions conference and I was headed back to Malawi in Africa to be able to teach a course. And all of a sudden in the back of my Uber as I was headed to the international airport, my phone began to buzz and I read in another student of mine from South Africa, now currently somewhere in the Middle East, said, Dr. Easter, you should know. And all of a sudden my heart began to fall because it went from being overjoyed to receive a message from him to realizing that he was letting me know that in the Sunday prior to my time in Miami that men in the community had had enough of Saeed and his wife and on a Sunday morning as men worshipped on one side and women on the other and children down in front all sitting on mats on the floor which would have been customary the men decided to come through the back became violent with the people including the children then just to humiliate, humiliate him, they put Saeed on his back by his legs, drug him out into this dirt road in front of this lean-to of an old building they were renting. And without explanation, threw him in the middle of these men, and they immediately started punching him in the head and the back and his gut until he fell to the ground, and they just continued to beat him. And the reports from those on the scene were that his blood began to just come out of his body. It was mixing with the dirt and caking on his body and he continued to roll as they would beat him and kick him. And finally, after all the anger had dissipated, those men just began to go back to where they had come from, just leaving him lying there in that dirt road. In the midst of that violence, the people in the congregation had just, well, they, they didn't get to run for their lives. And, and can you blame them? But at least they had the presence of mind to take Saeed's wife and two young daughters and put them in hiding. Only two men that Saeed had himself led to the Lord had the courage to go back to take his body thinking they would bury him. And when one of them stooped down, found him still breathing and put Saeed on his shoulder and those two men did the best they could to try to go undetected several kilometers back to that train depot that had brought Saeed and his family there. Others had brought his wife and two young children and together they accompanied them several hours back to the south where they put him in a hospital. He spent nearly three months in a hospital recovering from internal wounds. And one week, one week after being released, he took his wife and two children with his parents who had become believers. And Christian community prayed over them and they got back on that train in several hours to the north. And then on foot, walked right back into that same community that tried to take their lives. And they're still there to this day. Capacity. 
Now, you may be asking what peers and friends of his were asking, and that is, as they said, Dr. Easter, why would he go back? I mean, honestly, why would Saeed go back? Is he emotionally well? Is he stable? Is he okay? And I just shared with them what Saeed shared with me, and he said, John... He said, you see, if we can go for the first time in generations and over 200 people come to Jesus for the first time in just under two years, he said, perhaps if we go back and give our lives in this community, the whole village will come to know Jesus. Capacity. See, capacity drives you to do what you would normally never do in your own power, strength, or resources. We pray superficially, we give superficially, we go superficially. What about all out abandonment where we just pour out of what God has put in us and create an incredible river of his grace in both our own communities and abroad? Capacity. You see, because when we begin to lose confidence in the gospel, all of a sudden we begin to wonder about our children and grandchildren that walk away from the faith that we hold so dear. When we look at a nation that's divided and ruined in so many ways by our own appetites, and before long we begin to give in to that, we begin to be suspect, we begin to be suspicious. Before long, our own devotion to God's priorities begin to be called into question. We do enough to make us feel good and better about ourselves. But the truth is, you will feel so much better about yourself if we just surrender to what God says is the most important thing to his heart. Capacity. But if value and capacity are important, the third is what it's all about. And I like to call this significance. You see, if it's true that all people are made in the image of God and therefore they are the object of his love and desire to save, to restore that which has been broken back into what he intended for you and me, then it also means that he designed us with the capacity to embrace his grace and be changed by his love forever, then it also means that God has created us, made in his image, to have significance not just in a life somewhere thereafter, but in this life. Because what is often stated and quoted, God did not simply save us from something, he has saved us for something. That our lives have meaning as we recognize this in us and in others. Let me illustrate it this way. In this picture, you're going to see two friends of mine. One in blue and the other in a cultural headdress. 50 kilometers from the Somali border, one of the most unstable places on the planet. These two men were raised among the Afan Oromo Muslims. Our friend in blue ended up coming to faith as a young man because someone decided to share their faith of how God had changed them. And this young man, he ended up hearing for the first time about the love of God in Christ Jesus. He surrendered his life to Christ. He began to grow. He then felt called to ministry. He moved to Addis Ababa, the capital where we had a Bible school. He ended up getting his baccalaureate degree, then his master's degree. He decided after graduating, I'm going to plant a church. He planted a church. It grew to several hundred. He planted a second church, a third church, a fourth church. And then the leadership put their hands on him and said, we're going to make you the evangelism director for the whole nation. where you see me praying for him. And we'll take that down for security now. Something had just transpired a year before. And that is, is that our evangelism director decided to go back to the community to check on his aging parents to see how they were doing. And the man in the cultural headdress had had a different journey, though raised in the same area. Instead of coming to Christ, he was militarized by radical leaders in the Islamic faith in the Horn. He became a religious imam, not just over one mosque, but two. He became a very violent man. 
And when he had heard that our evangelism director was deciding to come down to revisit, he decided to send as a, just a weapon of terror. He was going to end up taking the life with other men in the community, this evangelism director, so that he would just send this message. And when our friend walked into the community where his family, with smiles on their faces, began to come out culturally to greet him, all of a sudden these men showed up throwing stones and hurling insults. And with the dust in the air, they began to carry out what they felt like was justice. And that was to kill him in front of his family. But in the middle of that, that religious imam, after throwing his stone, ended up having this, what he calls, spiritual panic attack. And he said, I began to turn my anger towards the very men who I had assembled and organized to kill our brother. And he said, I ran to the other side of the village where my own Boma was, crawled inside in the heat of the day, and somehow I fell asleep. And on the day that you saw me praying for him, he looked at me and said, I do not know if I had a vision or a dream. He says, but I know one thing. I encountered Isa, which is the name for Jesus. And he said, I crawled out after waking up on my hands and knees and he said I'm not a man of emotion when it comes to tears he says but I began to weep in the dirt and then I stood up panicking realizing that this evangelism director probably started running out of the community to save his life so I began to run to the other side and when I found him he was sitting having coffee with his mother and father and I fell to his feet asked his forgiveness and when I did, I then stood up and said, now teach me more about this Isa." And on that day, that evangelism director led him to a personal saving faith to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. And on the day that I ended up praying for him and heard this story through his own mouth, he had a different question. It was no longer tell me about this Isa." It was, with all the things that I've done in my life, as bad as I've been, as mean as I've been, as angry as I've been, he said, I know that the God is, that sent someone to me to tell Jesus about Jesus has saved me, but would God use me so then I can tell other people about him? He said, because I feel like God is calling me to be a preacher of the gospel. Would God allow me to do that? Well, he is now a student at one of the Bible schools in eastern Ethiopia. And he's already planted his first church and hasn't even graduated yet. <laughs> Can you say amen? <laughs> Significance. In this room, there are going to be people that are looking at me and you'll say, John, you have no clue about my background. You have no clue about my appetites. You have no clue about the things, the decisions, the destructiveness that I've brought based on my own sinfulness, my own bentness. And I'm going to tell you, whether you're here or watching online, that that's going to be true for all of us to different degrees. But we're equally sinful. And while behaviors have consequences and sinful actions have consequences, we're all guilty. But God in his love and grace has decided not only to make us candidates of his love, but to allow us to be instruments of his love. Hallelujah. To not just be candidates to receive his grace, but candidates to share his grace. And for those of you in here today, you are a candidate for both. That he calls us not only out of this world, he not only calls us to clean us, to wash us, to make us new, to make us his own, to adopt us, to call us his child, no matter who we are. But then he allows us to be able to serve him in ways that brings him glory so that what he's done in us, we can tell to the rooftops he will do for others. Because if you have value, because you are made in his image, which you are, then he's also designed you, every one of you and every person in this world with the capacity to authentically reach out and receive his grace without doubt, without fear, 
and be changed by it so that every single one of us can understand significance in this life as we follow him with abandonment. Can you say amen? amen? Now I'm going to sing a song and after I do, Pastor Scott will never invite me back here again. <laughs> when I flew back from Malawi or back from Miami to Malawi after hearing about Saeed, I walked into a room with 16 African leaders sitting around a U-shaped desk. And before I begin, in the middle was Gideon Banda, 6'3", 240 pounds, and said, Dr. Easter, may I say something? And I said, sure, Gideon. And he stood up, and all of a sudden, this big man looked at me, and before he could speak, tears started rolling down his face, and then he just took a moment to compose himself, and then looked at me and said, all my life, all my life, he said, I've had very little compared to the world. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know who he was. But someone decided I had enough value because of God's grace to share their testimony with me. And it changed me forever. And look at how he's using me today. He said, we heard about Saeed. He said, send me. Me and my wife will be faithful. We'll go. And all of a sudden, a young man took him by the arm and pulled himself up and looked at me and said, No! He said, Send me! He said, You know, I have nothing. I'm only here because of a scholarship. I don't even have a bed to my name. I live on a, I sleep on a mattress, he said. He said, but I have so much more than what the majority of this world has. He said, I have Jesus. And how can I not use my life letting other people know how good, how loving, how gracious this God is? Send me to the hard place, he said. I'll go. And all of a sudden, one by one, one by one, they began to stand up. But they were no longer looking at me. They were not talking or addressing me. Their hands were raised. And tears coming down their faces, surrendering their hearts to God, recognizing that what we do today is temporal, but what we do for God is eternal. Amen. And we began to sing a song. Mulungu, angate, 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 mulungu, angate, sale pera sona. Mulungu angate, angate, angate mulungu, angate sale pera sona. God can do anything, anytime, anywhere. God can do anything. He never fails. Do you believe that, church? Would you stand with me? As Pastor Scott comes, for every person in this place and every person watching online, here's the moment. That we are committing ourselves in this mission's emphasis in three weeks to pray because it matters. And God hears prayer. Things change because of prayer. And we give and we go. And today is giving. But before you give a dollar bill, you start with giving yourself. Because if you give yourself, everything else follows. What will you give? Not superficially, not $5 here, $10 here. If that's all you have, you give it. And God will honor all that you have. But for all of us here, what is God really calling us to give? I mean, really. Because I don't care if you're here and you're 16 years old or you're here and you're 88. Doesn't matter the generations, the background, the experiences for every one of us in here. 
we made a decision to follow Christ and then we ask ourselves based on those motives, God, what really concerns your heart and whatever that is, my time, talent and treasure will follow. I don't know why I really don't. I don't know why God would want to spend and invest in me for salvation, but I really don't know why he would want us to participate. But for whatever reason, not only did he choose us, but he decided to allow us to be part of what he's doing redemptively by sharing it. As you are called to give this morning, as you come to the front, as Pastor Scott leads you, the question is, as you're motivated by value, capacity, and significance, don't let it just stop with you. Recognize that this should be true for every single person in our world who God loves made in his image. Because if he values them, so do we. Today, church, I'd like you to give as though it matters, because it does. Give generously, and as you come, dedicate your heart anew. And then give generously because you know that so many others deserve the chance to hear about Jesus with the same opportunity that was provided to you. Thank you, Chapel Springs, for what you do. Thank you for caring. Thank you for creating this emphasis. Amen. Thank you, John. John's going to come back and pray for the offering in a moment. So first of all, I just want you to, to know that in about five minutes after we've worshipped and given, I have a very special announcement that you're not going to want to miss, okay? So you want to stay till the end today. So we're entering into worship now, back into worship. And there are giving envelopes if you are have a check or cash that you're giving today. This offering is both our tithe and offering for Chapel Springs, but we're asking everybody to give an offering to missions. And on every envelope, there's a special line that says missions. And the same thing is true. We're going to put the slide up for all the different ways to give. There's a, there's a slide for the different ways to give. It's going to come up in a minute because most of our giving now, about 60, 70% comes in through our church app, our, our website, uh, texting over the text line, it, it, it comes in a variety of ways. And so we wanted to make sure that everybody could worship today and make a move. And so these cards that say pray, give, and go, if you're going to give electronically in one of these ways, we want you all to, also to participate because we're going to enter back into worship and we're going to come and bring our gifts to the Lord and put them in these receptacles. And then there's a pray, give, go magnet that I want everybody to take with them so that you can remember that you're committing yourself not just to give today to missions, but you'll commit yourself to give regularly to our missionaries. There are different projects we're gonna give toward. John's gonna explain it in just a moment. One of the things we're doing is we're gonna give a significant gift to the Chi Alpha College Ministry of Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. He was with us last week, right? God has given them a special opportunity to purchase a home right in the middle of campus, and we're gonna to give toward that. So let's offer ourselves, Lord Jesus, now as we come before you in worship, we present ourselves to you right now through our giving. Be glorified through it all, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. When you're ready, come and bring your gift and drop it in the receptacle. Everybody, students, teenagers, everybody can give something. Doesn't matter how big the gift, it's our hearts, it's our commitment, it's giving ourselves. Let's worship Jesus. Praise God. Don't you love all those that serve in ministry at Chapel Springs in a variety of ways? And I'm just so thankful for all of them. And praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So one of the projects is helping Chi Alpha purchase and renovate that house right in the midst of Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. To God be the glory. And we heard that 
and we're going to give a gift to Kyrgyzstan, which is the missionaries. We're going to have a virtual mission trip next Sunday and, and all those others. And so, John, could you just share with us a couple of other very important initiatives that we're going to be giving toward? Yeah, so some of those initiatives are going to include focus on the Buddhist and Hindu world. Nearly 25% of our world fall within those two large population blocks, and it represents a much of the world that has yet to really receive a witness of Christ, where the church is extremely weak, mm. and where we just sense that God is calling us with our partner churches yeah. to say that we want to see that changed, amen? Yes, yes. And we, we, we know that they are made in God's image, that God loves them, and we yes. want to say, what, how can we utilize these funds to be able to truly make an impact to see more missionaries and global workers sent churches established yes. and people come to Christ yes in the and Hindu and the Hindu Buddhist and Buddhist world, world. Yes. and that will be significant yeah. uh, secondly we're very excited because Continental Theological Seminary is in Brussels Belgium mm -hmm. and Europe is no longer post Christian or post post Christian the generation today is actually pre-Christian. Pre-Christian. I like the sound of that. Yeah. So yeah. the majority of Europeans today, less than 5% of them have ever heard an adequate witness of Jesus. Wow. Most of the churches you see are old. They're tourist attractions. That's right. Or they're churches where they really don't understand the gospel yeah. today. Yeah. And so we're saying, what will, it, what will it take to raise up a whole new generation? And there are, there's this awakening happening. You've heard about it happening in America. Mm -hmm. There's this awakening happening in Europe. And not only are they coming to faith, mm -hmm. Pastor Scott, yeah. they are sensing God's calling them for the next generation of church, planting churches. Yes. So at CTS, they're going to expand their buildings to bring in families and young men and women to be able to prepare them to be church planters across Europe. Western and Eastern Europe. Wow. Isn't that amazing? It's awesome. And so you guys will be helping glory. with those expansion plans. Amen. The third area is going to be in the area of uh, unreached peoples among uh, of, of the Muslim faith. And we have seen, it's hard to describe, 20 years ago when we began really engaging, I mean truly investing engaging, like we're about to do with the Buddhist Hindu world. We have very few missionaries serving there and very few churches. We are seeing right now, we don't talk about it openly a lot, but we're seeing the greatest number of Muslims in, our gener in generations that we're aware of come to faith come to in Jesus. Jesus. Sometimes oh. in very in countries and nations where you would be shocked, mm -hmm. and the underground churches are exploding. And we are going to put this. We're going to end up investing with your help in ensuring that those initiatives that are already underway that we're able to go to the next phases on those right and that's a lot of evangelism and church planning and discipling yes and we're very excited about what that means so Amen. thank you for what you're doing i think it's very exciting yes. absolutely to god be the glory amen yes. to god be the glory amen now for my special announcement <laughs> yeah so most of you already know and those that are new among us you may not know that uh, f first of all, this has been a, a missions church for decades, and and this church has been faithful, and we've given above and beyond. Um, many churches much larger than us. God, God just has opened up the heart of this church to give to missions. To God be the glory, and because we have been faithful and generous, the Lord blessed us with this wonderful property. And most of you, many of you, know that in August of this last year, we sold several acres of excess land in the, in the back, that way, <laughs> toward Bristow and the railroad tracks, right? And it, it, was, it was a significant amount of money in August. And so we've been in the process of making preparation to receive this money, to invest it wisely. And we're taking a significant portion of it, and that will happen next month. We are creating a missions endowment that is going to have the ability to fund missions until Jesus comes Amen. back to the Amen. glory of God. That's Amen. Awesome. Just in an extraordinary way. Amen. That's amazing. Unbelievable. But I didn't want to give this announcement because I don't ever want God's blessing of the sale of that property to do our giving for us. If that's going to deform us, then let's just give, give, give it all away and not, right? No, no. God's going to 
we're going to steward that. That's awesome. But in the next last service, first service, this service. And so today, we are going to give a first fruit offering to Assemblies of God World Missions. That is going to go toward that Buddhist Hindu priority, leadership, training for church planners throughout Europe, yeah. reaching unreached people groups in the secular and Muslim world. We're going to give a first fruit of a million dollars to a sums of God yeah. world <laughs> missions. To God be the glory. Amen. That is amazing. Amen. That is Can awesome. Can we say hallelujah, that is awesome. King Jesus? Awesome. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. 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 That's amazing. And we're believing and trusting God that the missions endowment that we are starting will be able to, at a minimum, continue to give a million dollars a year to missions beyond what we're going to give. Come on, amen? Amen. Because we're going to stay generous. We need to keep doing the very same things that God caused God to entrust us with this resource. Amen? We're going to keep praying, giving, and going to the glory of God. So I know we've gone, we've gone late today. But this is so important. Yeah. And so, John, will you pray over this offering? Pray over us. And I want to invite you, if you're physically able, before we leave today, to take a moment and get on your knees. That's why we still have carpet in the sanctuary. Get on your knees. Let's just, this is a holy moment. It's a historic moment to the glory of God. Brother John, it's been great to have you with us. What a powerful challenge. Would you pray for us in Jesus' name? Heavenly Father, for those of us in this room and those watching by line who are taking this moment as we bend a knee as a sign of our surrenderance to your lordship, we also are recognizing that part of that is, is that we are choosing right now to align the priorities at Chapel Springs with your heart. And your heart is for those who have not yet come to know you, to experience your grace, to know your love, to be transformed. And Lord, we pray that this investment and this offering that Lord that it will lead to people coming to know Christ that it will result in lives transformed Amen. for those that are bound to be set free for those who are in darkness to be rescued for Lord those that are desperately needing a message of hope to receive hope we pray Lord that this investment and that which is to come Lord will lead to the furtherance of your kingdom, yes, to the proclamation of Jesus, yes, to knowing, Lord, that we are establishing healthy, life-giving churches among all peoples everywhere, to see disciples made, to see people truly, radically changed by your love. And so we commit this at this moment, and I pray, oh God, I pray for your blessing on individuals and the families that make up Chapel Springs. I thank you, oh Lord, for their generous hearts, for their vision, for prioritizing, for creating a moment, an action step, for recognizing how holy this moment is, for dedicating not only the past but the future to ensuring, Lord, that we will stay on mission. We will not deviate from what concerns your heart, Amen. that we will do nothing except Amen. what you've called us to do. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you that Chapel Springs is an oasis of love and grace to the world in a world that's so broken and desperately needs you. And I thank you for Pastor Scott. I thank you, Lord, for the leadership team, for the board. I thank you, O oh God, for their, for their incredible vision. And I pray, Lord, that the years to come will only result in changed lives in your glory. And we commit this and with the whole church say. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure you turn your bell notifications on so you know each and every time we push out another video. Until next time, let's go live for Jesus.